thank you for coming. And uh, I did jump in, uh, like was previously said, at the last moment. And so I will try our best, or we will collectively try our best to have uh, as thorough as possible uh, of a discussion about the book and about uh, the themes in which it touches, which are very important and relevant uh, to the issue of sex work. And... Um, um, at least as best as, as we can, considering this uh, last moment uh, group improvisation. Um, so this part of the book was chosen to be, uh, to be read to you guys, because in it, as you guys have heard, it uh, encompasses a lot of different issues that are important, whether it's uh, the issue of stigmatization, the issue of representation, who has the right to speak uh, of sex workers, uh, how is the issue uh, of sex work publicly presented and who controls it amongst uh, others. And we will try to address those issues a little bit deeper within the context of this discussion. Um, uh, as was probably, as you guys would probably tell, uh, within the context of this book, it is written predominantly uh, in an American context, but the issues uh, in which it is presented, and particularly the issue of stigmatization, are relevant uh, in a global context, um, despite the different variations uh, in which uh, it is these, in the ways in which uh, these. Uh, different issues are implemented in different parts of the world, but because uh, of its relevance also here in Germany, uh, this book was translated because it's super relevant. So what I would like to start, to do as a start, is to give a brief introduction uh, to the German situation, and what we will tr try to do is somewhat bridge uh, the gap between a little bit the American context and the German one so that we can draw parallel trajectories uh, about those topics and how they are uh, internationally relevant. And I will particularly bring that into the context of po policing and criminalization, which is maybe the first issue that we would like to address. So... Just a little bit uh, for those of you who are uh, lesser informed about the German context, just to give sort of uh, uh, an overall in introduction to what has happened here. So prostitution was legalized uh, in this country in over 10 years ago, but uh, by the Prostitutionsgesetz, as it was called, 1922. Hmm? 1922? Legalization. I will, I will refer specifically to the... Say that again? It was legalized in 1927. Yes. And, okay. Um, yeah, and only the, the uh, prostitution law um, came into action in 2002. So Great. Okay, so Thank you. Feel, feel free to jump in with more important uh, information like this. We will need it. Um, the law that uh, the Prostitutionsgesetz that was written after a fight by sex workers in 2002 uh, was written, which declared sex work as work. But uh, we should say that it was not fully implemented. Uh, it was not fully, not all parts of the laws were recognized and there were a lot of discrepancies in how it was implemented and what parts were implemented. And further we should say that the law did not really work uh, or there was no further uh, far-reaching effects into destigmatization of sex work in the German context. Among the same, or around the same time period, there was also um, a mass wave of migration that started in Europe following the formation of the EU and the opening of the borders. This is Europe-wide, and which of course had an effect not only on sex industry looks, but uh, on demographics and work overall. Um, in the last several years, there has been several political campaigns against prostitution, this time again under the guise of saving women or under uh, anti-trafficking. The, uh, the German law has produced, you can say, uh, false statistics 
in which uh, conflated the rates of trafficking in Germany and posed internationally as a false model, and I say false because the statistics are wrong, I say a false model for um, um, a false model for trafficking and Germany was seen as a land for trafficking and based on that many anti-trafficking campaigns focusing on Germany starting here. Um, in the last several years particularly these sort of came together with a general um, feminist or feminist in quotas um, based uh, debates and uh, arguments against uh, prostitution um, to form several campaigns. The better known ones are those by Alice Schwarzer through Emma magazine and the appeal gegen, uh, the appeal gegen prostitution, the, the campaign, the appeal against prostitution, which was previously here discussed. Um, of course, again, under the guise of saving, um, of saving all traffic victims and seeing sex workers as victims anyway. Um, all of these things had several effects on, on the people who are working as sex workers in this country. First of all, on a legal level, there has been a pressure to change the law or to form a new law. And one is being proposed uh, as we speak, and it will be up for discussion in November. Um, right now, the, the proposals are about forced registration of sex workers, where they have to uh, register their names and get actual cards. And another one is a law uh, in which trafficking and sex work are essentially seen as one, uh, one concept or one term, which is essentially contradictory to the existing law. Nobody knows exactly how those two laws will work with one another. Um, there's also been, aside from the, the legal perspective, there's also been um, a vast increase in raids. So while the law hasn't changed, there has been uh, a level of pressure on the authorities to save women. And in turn, what this has done is... Um, is put p pressure on the authorities. We actually also see this as, of course, an in, in increasing a budget in order to do that, in which uh, the different authorities come to brothels um, trying to, to, to see who is there, who is unregistered. Um, I just want to speak very briefly about the effect that it has on sex workers um, and those who should be saved. The result of it, for people like myself who do work... Uh, who do outreach uh, in brothels and who enter brothels is that it has become very difficult for us to, to come in and to get uh, in contact with sex workers, um, at least more difficult than it was before. And because uh, people who are under pressure from the state cannot really essentially tell the difference between groups who do services or who provide services to them and who are there to provide empowerment or provide services and those who are there to to repress them, to deport them, uh, to put pressure on them. And essentially the bottom, and because of that, the door stays shut. So even if there are people who are working under exploitative conditions, they are not, um, they would not be willing to open the doors and say, yes, please come and get me. Um, the, um, just a second. So essentially what we can say that police, there is police repression on the industry and this is something that uh, you also describe in your, uh, your book. So it is uh, that the concept of sex work uh, is treated on criminal, as criminal grounds. Uh, even within legalized context, like what we have here, the general uh, demand and the bottom line from the feminist discourse and from uh, the Bundestag, from the parliament, is we are lacking controls. We need more control. We need more elements of controlling the sex industry. So I would just, li I would just like, in this point, to tie the connection between this uh, American context in which you speak in the book and the global uh, context and just to quote you from the book, rather than um, couching crackdowns on sex work as fighting crime, some feminists appeal to the police to pursue stings against the sex trade in the name of gender equality. We can't arrest our way to feminist utopia, but that has not stopped influential women's rights organizations 
from demanding that we try. I would like to ask you if you could expand on the link between criminalization uh, and the sex industry and maybe expand on some common links uh, where, uh, where specifically controls have the root. Absolutely, thank you. It's a beautiful summary as well. Um, hi. <laughs> This is phenomenal. I, this is the third time I've been in Berlin, and it's not the first time I've had a microphone in Berlin in my face either, but this is like the best possible space to be in um, and talking about this book. And I have just so much respect for organizers in Germany, uh, who, sex workers working in Germany, organizing for their rights, and many people in this room who organize around the world who I've learned a lot from. Um, for me, the, the critical link here between... Uh, criminalization, when we talk about the United States, where we live under a system of absolute criminalization, where pretty much anything that has to do with, uh, with prostitution is considered illegal, whether that's buying or selling or running a business or advertising. Um, and even other kinds of commercial sex exist in a legal gray area and are quite unprotected, like lap dancing or even pornography. Um, are also in sort of a gray area at times. And people have experienced crackdowns and have experienced... Um, repression from police and, and law enforcement, and now increasingly from financial institutions who are making it very difficult for people to actually have a real bank account if they're associated with, with porn, particularly online porn. Um, the, the common root of all of that is that the sex industry might get out of control if we don't have an aggressive approach to it, that, that sex workers are uniquely disruptive and unruly. And that actually fits quite well, I think, with that the feminist discourse around saving women, that there are some women who know better than other women, that there are, the state knows better than we do ourselves. And to me, that seems like such a fundamental violation of a feminist principle of bodily autonomy, um, that we actually, that goes beyond, you know, my body, my choice, right? I mean, your bodily autonomy just isn't about what you do with your body. It's you as a citizen. It's you as a public person. It's you with your right to speak in public. And, and the way that sex workers are consistently robbed of the right to speak for their own experience and the right to speak with expertise by feminists, not all feminists, I should say, not every feminist <laughs> believes this, but a particular part of feminism, that it's, its idea of what sex work is and its stigmatizing approach to sex work is actually quite in line with the mainstream conception of who a sex worker is, so that they don't actually have to work very hard to convince lawmakers to go along with them because it's pretty much what people are at um, if they haven't really considered these issues. Um, they also tend to treat sex work as an abstract issue, kind of a litmus test for how feminist you are, rather than an issue of people's working lives and an issue of labor. Um, they, they very much sexualize the issue. They very much talk about emotional stories of pain and victimhood and don't really get into the dry, boring bullshit, sorry to swear, that most sex workers do talk about um, when we're at work. And, and I think that there's such a disconnect between what exists in their imagination, which I refer to as the prostitute imaginary in, their, in the book, and the oftentimes incredibly dull reality of sex work. So my, my big victory for me would be if we could move away from is sex work empowering or is sex work exploitative, but sex work is just work. And like most work, it's often very boring. Um, like most work, we have complicated relationships to it. And like most work, the people who should be in charge of it are not the police. And, and so that's that would be where I would lead this back to you, which is under legalization, the police are still being given that role. And even though it might be legal, it's very difficult to have a legal business. And it's very difficult for people to appeal to their rights in a context where police are seen as the overseer. And I wonder, you know, it's, it, for people outside of Germany, even people ask me this all the time in the States, like, oh, but Germany is so great because of legalization. Um, and I, I look for ways to kind of explain that to them, that actually even under legalization, sex workers can be robbed of control. And that, that's really the fundamental principle. Do sex workers have control over their workplaces and the politics that govern their lives? Was this a question that was uh, posed back at me? Yeah, or we can go wherever you want to. <laughs> well, you know, I would actually... You can save it for the end if you want. I would like, I would like to say, some, I would say something very briefly about this. 
and maybe we can address another another issue which is the economical issue i mean i think that first and foremost the reason that uh sex workers do not have uh most of the control over their economic situations is that many of them are not uh, the head of the brothel, they are not the owner, uh, they are workers, and those situations are not really any different than um, any sort of most workplaces. People that do work by themselves or have uh, the relative privilege of working independently do, but they are still not the majority. And... Um, and the economy, I mean, I would like to speak about a, a Berlin uh, a context because this is, this is where I live and this is uh, what I know. A lot of people here uh, have uh, go to, to, to do sex work because there are very few well-paid jobs. And, so they, and, and sex work is still something that affords them the ability um, to, to do that. But still, having said that, uh, they are not at the top uh, of the chain, if you can say, or they are not at the top of of the market chain, and but this is not really any different than any sort of industry. So I refuse to accept a, uh, you can say, uh, an exceptionalist position, a position in which se the sex industry is seen as outside of the rest of the market. Um, and with that, I would like to first of all, I want to say, Katarina, because uh, you did mention yourself that if you would have any other comments or questions to say, that you would jump in. So I would want to encourage you to to feel free to do so. Um, I want to to raise the economic issue particularly um, because. You uh, have stated, if I am not mistaken, that uh, the people who are responsible for making sex work attractive to potential sex workers, uh, according to some um, uh, sex work, or sorry, anti-prostitution activists, are factors like the movie Pretty Woman or the television show The Secret Diary of a Call Girl, and not, or for instance, what they, um, what is called pimp culture in hip hop, but the factors who are not responsible or who are not held responsible apparently are, for instance, the labor market, the privatization of education or healthcare, and I would like to also add uh, migration, because m much of the migration that we see in this country is economically based, and people do move here in search of a better, uh, better quality of life. Um, and, and essentially, what we see in this sort of a context is that the body of the sex worker carries the burden, uh, not only uh, the economic burden uh, that is, is put as a result of this, uh, of the economy or of othering in, in other contexts, for instance, as, as a migrant, uh, but on top of that, the issue of stigmatization um, and uh, being, out, being the outsider of society as a result of her being a sex worker and being put to blame uh, for those as well. So um, I would just like to ask you in this uh, particular uh, when touching on this issue, is that one of the uh, one of the means in which you suggest or in which you speak in your your book that would be uh, a suggestion to this is the mainstreaming of sex work as a as a service industry as a potential solution. So first of all, if you could elaborate on that, I think the first kind of uh, examples that you talked about there from the book, the idea from particular anti prostitution. Uh, schools of thought that what causes prostitution are the glamorization of sex work um, and not just basic needs for money and survival. Um, that's one of kind of the biggest gaps, I think, to breach because it's not sexy to talk about survival, right? You can't have like a very emotional public debate when you don't have sexual images of women to hang the debate on. Um, and to use your phrase, the, the, which is beautiful, that the, the body of the sex worker ends up carrying the burden, I think here the body of the sex worker is scapegoated for many of these things and blamed for things that are, are absolutely not within the control of a sex worker's life, whether that's the reasons that people migrate or the reasons that education becomes expensive or the reasons that health care becomes expensive. It's like, don't go talk about that. Let's just talk about the sex worker's body. And it 
it robs us of an opportunity to actually confront economic inequality and injustice. And it robs us of the opportunity to actually do that in solidarity with others who are experiencing that as well, right? So we end up blaming sex workers or distracting ourselves with sex work when we could actually, could you imagine what it would look like um, if feminists in the United States, for example, wanted to bring the Swedish model of healthcare to the United States instead of the Swedish model of anti-prostitution law, right? I would fully support them in this. I'm not an expert on the Swedish model of healthcare, but I'm sure it's like probably a little better than, than <laughs> what we have. Um, I mean, the only time I had good healthcare was when I worked at a sex worker clinic. So I was very privileged to have that. Um, it's, there's something about stigma also and scapegoating that... It exceptionalizes sex work, as you said, right? It treats all of these issues as if they're absolutely unique to sex work. And then it allows certain people to kind of do their whole politics about sex work and sex workers' bodies. So uh, when I was just in, in Zurich, I, someone asked me a question about men who go to lap dance clubs and isn't it terrible that men are the people in our society who have all the excess money to go to lap dance clubs and why do men have all this disposable income to spend on sex? And I was like, because men have the disposable income, period right? Like, maybe that's the problem to solve, not where they're spending their money. Um, I'm much more concerned about the activities of the men at Lehman Brothers, well, they don't exist anymore, Goldman Sachs, <laughs> than I am concerned about the activities of men who go to lap dance clubs. Maybe they're even the same men, but the activity that I'm most concerned about is actually the one that results in destroying the economy. So I think, like, we have to, like, broaden our fight here, right? And I think that that's much more challenging to do. Um, and it, it demands that we have a much bigger imagination also of what solutions could look like. Um, this whole idea of like arresting ourselves to feminist utopia I think sounds very attractive because it makes feminists the heroes. Um, but what if sex workers were the heroes, right? Um, the idea, and we are. But I mean, what if we, we are among many heroes and heroines. But you know, I think that the, it's a question of like who has the solutions, who gets to lead, who gets to take us into this, this new utopia. And I don't know how it is here, but it can say in the US, the economic issues that the mainstream feminist movement is most concerned with are ideas of getting women into the boardroom. And they're not so concerned about women working in the service economy. They're not so concerned about uh, people who are, you know, working a fast food job and living in a homeless shelter because they can't actually afford to live off the wages from their fast food job. They're not concerned with nurses' unions being broken. They're not concerned with teachers being scapegoated for all the failures of education. So they're, they're, it's like their whole work agenda is skewed towards the women at the top. And so, of course, sex workers are left out of that. Okay. It's fairly comprehensive, but I would like to, 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 and it touches on a lot of different issues, and I would like to still stay on the issue of uh, economically and kind of uh, address it uh, more specifically. I mean, a part of the sex workers' rights movement, at least one part, one solution that it gives, is that we do uh, focus, I would like to say we, uh, focus on... Uh, contextualizing and mainstreaming sex work into existing labor structures as a part of uh, at least of a first step um, and in having a system that is based I would say on unequal access to the labor market uh, within divisions that we have now which are based on race that are based on gender and that are based on class um, mainstreaming is seen um, as a first step against uh, in fighting the stigma. Um, so, and this is within uh, sex work itself. So, but maybe you can say a little bit about how you see this and what do you think the next step after that should be? Sure. And I sidestepped that unintentionally. There was a whole question there. <laughs> I got to it before I got to that one. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, mainstreaming, I feel like it's not a pro or con thing, it's happening. It's just the reality. The, the example that I focus on in the book, because it's been very well researched, is of Nevada in the United States, which is the only state where there's any kind of legal prov provision for legal prostitution um, and I, in a system that I believe is somewhat parallel to how some, some legalization of prostitution functions in Germany. The, there, you can only do it in a brothel and only in certain circumstances you have to register and all of these things that might be coming here soon as well. Um, it's not a great system. A lot of people don't like it and would prefer to work independently and underground versus work in this very tightly controlled space. So that's you know, only in the very rural counties of Nevada. 
It's not where Las Vegas is, right? It's not where the tourists go. But Las Vegas uses the existence of legal prostitution to kind of advertise themselves to the rest of the world. Um, so the, the, the sociologists that I, I cite in the book and the work that um, they've done in Nevada on the legal brothels points to something they call um, convergence. So rather than thinking that the rest of the economy that isn't about the sex economy is sexualizing itself, which I think is sometimes what we hear, like, oh, our whole culture is sexualizing itself. What they say is actually the sex industry is mainstreaming itself, and it's converging into all of the other leisure and service economies. That the, the lines between them are blurry, and when they asked workers at the Nevada brothels what other kinds of work they did, the vast majority of them, well over three quarters, had never worked in the sex industry before and had done other service work. So when we talk about mainstreaming, we're also talking about the same workers, right? People are moving between these jobs. I also found this uh, in another uh, study of dancers uh, in a, a formerly industrial part of the Midwest, which after the collapse of the American car industry, a lot of men who kind of were the economic engine of that community lost their jobs and so women started doing more of the the income earning and one of the jobs that was available to them were working in dance clubs but they were also doing low wage retail work they were also doing nanny work they were picking up multiple gigs and this is also sort of seems like it's the way the economy is going the idea that you'll have one job that's your job for the rest of your life I think we've left that era for the most part um, and so this is also I think where the internet comes in um, you know, the idea that you could actually just put up an ad and do some work when you wanted to in the sex industry and take that ad down and then go on with the rest of your life is quite transformative. It starts to, I think, create some anxiety in the larger culture that now all of a sudden we can't point to who the prostitute is, right? Because anybody could just put up an ad and do some work. And they might be your neighbor and they might be your sister and they might be your teacher, you know, who knows who they are. And I think that that's also part of the panic that's going on right now is the mainstreaming is happening and it's challenging some of our very basic ideas and our deeply held prejudices about who sells sex and the status that they hold in the world and our ability to scapegoat that community. Um, we freak out when we lose a scapegoat. And a lot of other people who've been scapegoated for their sexuality or their outsider status have been achieving rights in a way that sex workers have not. They haven't caught up in the same way. And I wonder if that's part of it, too, that sex workers are still so easily scapegoated. And so it's our industry that gets looked at as the exceptional or dirty or bad one. But really, the entire economy is trending in the same direction as, as sex work is. I would maybe just like to, to give a a local reference uh, to a little bit of what you said, something that I saw today, just as an example in, uh, in Betsit, which is the, the, uh, a, a quasi-tabloid newspaper, and the front page uh, was a, a cover article about uh, a poor woman in Berlin who could no longer make money, that's what the, the, the title says, could not make ends meet while working as a hairdresser, and therefore she turned into uh, prostitution. Um, unfortunately, the story is called The Saddest, uh, the saddest Girl in Venus. It is the name of uh, the brothel in which she works. Um, but in that, um, it touches on a lot of point, uh, again, in here, in which you touch, in which people move from one industry to another. They work uh, uh, part-time in jobs where, in other jobs, they cannot make ends meet. Um, or they move in between, between different things, uh, seasonally or otherwise, also in between borders and in between countries when uh, these things are available in different parts rather than just st sticking to the more classical notion of a profession. Um, unfortunately, all of this had to be contextualized as the poor woman, the poor sex worker, it is against her body that is on the line and she is the one who is uh, theoretically suffering according to, um, to the way that... Uh, uh, it is uh, framed rather than bringing up issues about the economy or rather um, than trying to look for solutions of what we what can we do to either improving the work, working conditions in specific situations either within the sex industry or let's say in hairdressing or overall um, in other conditions rather than uh, than pushing uh, the the bodies of the women and the people who are in sex work workers uh, to the margins of society by uh, such tabloid level articles. 
although they are not just done on a tabloid level. Um, Certainly not. I want to address another issue uh, to you, which is something that you, uh, you touch on in your book, and that is on the issue of terminology. In my experience, terminology is very important in this in Germany, in, in the German language. How you speak about things is uh, super important. And <laughs> it's not just what you say, it's the words that you pick. Um, and you do explain in your book that uh, how the word prostitute uh, was formed and um, as a means of uh, identifying and defining people who are selling sexual services and how it was created in the 19th century. Whereas the word whore, for instance, uh, has a much longer history that refers to women who were seen as behaving sexually immorally, quote unquote. Uh, but not necessarily getting money in exchange for it. And this I find very interesting, um, in how particularly in the, the dominant modern imagery, the exchange of money for sexual services is commonly believed to be the true uh, etymological roots of the word whore. And I wonder myself if the dangerous elements of this word prostitute that led to the creation of this particular identity um, is to be read not only in terms of naming and controlling this figure that threatens family values and health, but is also in economical terms like a threat to giving any sort of economical power to other classes um, who uh, cannot be controlled or the subjects who are not uh, the society doesn't seem as desirable that they gain it. And in this sense, we can make all sorts of parallel lines, not just to sex workers, but also to, um, to trans people, uh, to racialized and migrant people, uh, and all sorts of people who are othered, that they are also not desired to have money. So maybe you can say... Um, how you read and interpret the fact that possibly the strongest moral insult for a woman has been molded to mean what we call today a sex worker. Yeah, it, it's something that, I mean, when you think about it, to, to say that something that's happened forever, which is exchanging sex for what you need to survive, it's really only around the 19th century that that becomes a person who does a thing and not an activity that is done. And I think that's one of the, the critical distinctions. It also comes up around the same time in history where we get the word homosexual. And then a few years later, the word heterosexual. Um, so we have this, this moment in time where all of a sudden sexuality is not about just a thing that you do, but it's a thing that you are. And you know that's, that's part of a whole kind of shift in our culture, I think. But particularly around prostitution, it's a way, I think, of saying that you the way that you made money is illegitimate, and so you are illegitimate, right? Um, you know, laws around prostitution in the United States, the criminalized prostitution came way after um, this period, right? We didn't actually fully find ways to outlaw prostitution in the United States, not that it stopped prostitution in the United States, but until 1917 was when we see our first kind of federal laws um, abolishing uh, red light districts. And the excuse for that was World War I and venereal disease. We couldn't have prostitutes around soldiers, um, who of course are pure and good. And the prostitutes are dangerous and vectors of disease, which we hear to this day, right? So, I mean, there's a way that like your money is also made a vector of immorality or illegitimateness, and you by extension. Um, I, this is an area that I want to dig into a whole lot more. Um, I want to know, you know what is going on in that period around industrialization, around the very beginnings of labor organizing, around the very beginnings of women working outside the home, which I put in huge quotation marks because at least in the American context, women have always worked outside the home, enslaved women who were brought to the United States for the purpose of doing household work, unpaid, enslaved conditions. But when we, in, commonly in the United States, when people say women working outside the home, what they mean by that is white middle class women or working class women at the end of the 19th century working outside the home. But that phenomenon of like women might be going to work comes up around the same time as we get laws against prostitution. And also the, that wave of the women's movement 
comes up in the US anyway in concert with the temperance movement, so the anti-alcohol movement, and the right to vote movement. And some of the first political campaigns of women suffragists in the late 19th century were red light abatement laws to try to prohibit the existence of red light districts. And they started that in Iowa and then California and then they became a nationwide trend. And I actually found some historical clippings of prostitutes going out on marches and strikes against those red light abatement laws in the United States. 2000 in Chicago at the turn of the last century. And there's a, in the book, I quote an open letter from prostitutes in Washington, DC. And I say prostitute here because that's what they called themselves. Right, The word sex worker, just to bring this forward, comes into practice in the late 70s and through the 80s and 90s. And I think what's important about that word is it describes, again, an identity based on an activity, not necessarily who you are. And what's interesting about it, when I was interviewing people for the book, um, Sarah Elspeth Patterson, who runs a sex work health project in New York, told me, you know, actually what they use in their project is the phrase, people who are engaged in the sex trades, because that again de-emphasizes being something and is more about what you do. Because even the term sex work has become loaded. And even the term sex worker has, has now taken on in the imagination a particular kind of picture. And they found that in many of the communities that they worked in, it wasn't relevant. And they also noted that many sex workers don't use the term sex worker at work, right? We say escort, dom, hooker, ho, cam girl, porn star. Um, I never said to one of my clients, I'm a sex worker. So I, I think that that's a really interesting tension, too, that we have this identity around our organizing, and we have this identity when we go and talk at an AIDS conference or in a global health context, um, but we don't necessarily use that identity in our work. The reason it's so important for me, um, and in this book, it's given me space to exist, right? I can say I'm a former sex worker, and I don't have to tell you anything else about what was criminal or what wasn't criminal. I don't have to expose myself to that risk. I don't have to give a long resume of everything that I've done, which really pisses off journalists. And they, and they have tried to construct it for me. And, and the, the, the thing about it is it's not a secret. I mean, I've been writing about that part of my life too. It's just not this book, right? This book isn't about my experience as a sex worker. This book is an intervention in how people who aren't sex workers think about sex work and how we can transform that. And I think that that's part of what makes people uncomfortable is they are not used to being the subject of our gaze and our examination and our critique. And, and so I know that there are many people who call themselves sex workers who had experiences very different than my own, and I want to be real and honest about that, um, but also still be in solidarity with them. I, that's the only term I think that's big enough that allows us to do that, so I'm very protective of it. Um, but I also know that our language will probably change again. Katarina, do you have something to ask? I don't want to steal the mic from you. No, um, <clears throat> just follow your questions, and I might come in in the general discussion then later with some questions. Okay. So then, having said that, I do want to touch um, as an issue on this thing that you said about essentially how we position ourselves um, as sex workers and how that sort of paints you, because a lot of uh, the sex, the anti-prostitution discourse has been very, very effective, and I would like to say also particularly in a very specific way here in Germany. Well, in some ways specific, in other ways not specific at all, um, because these arguments are used all over the world. Insane, for instance, you guys who see yourself as sex workers belong to a particular group of people. You see that as an identity rather than uh, anything else, rather than a position, uh, and do a divide and conquer that is based on that. Um, and essentially, uh, there comes a question of how is this division between different sex workers, is, uh, if such divisions could be, be made, uh, are used to, to sort of uh, do a divide and conquer amongst us in order to try to, to, silence, uh, to silence a lot of sex workers from speaking. So it is a question of representation and who has the right to speak. I mean, um, a lot of abolitionists, people who oppose, um, who oppose sex work, say, first of all, you don't have the right to speak as long as you're still doing it because you are still under the, the false mentality uh, of those who speak it. You, you have a, um, a false, what is the Freudian term for it? False consciousness, thank you. Um, and then also to turn to the people who are uh, migrants and say, 
uh, no, they don't turn it to the migrants, but rather to the other uh, sex workers and say, you don't represent the majority. Um, I, I mean, first of all, particularly here in Germany, a lot of the people who do, and again, I don't think that this is uh, uh, only a German uh, model, the people who do speak out uh, and try to influence the debate are people who have more privilege, uh, more language skills, more access, have the privilege of outing themselves sometimes, which is not a privilege that all uh, sex workers have. In fact, not most sex workers have. Um, and, uh, and they use the privileges they have to influence the debate. But in turn, uh, what happens is that uh, the that this gaze is sort of uh, shifted to them, and, and then it is said, but you don't represent everybody else, and in fact, those who are the alleged everybody else are often put in the position of the subaltern, or the ones uh, who cannot speak, who are nameless, who don't have a face, who are never there, but in their name, it is the majority of the policies in these countries uh, that are made, so we are sort of subjected to this sort of... Uh, uh, divide and conquer, despite the fact that, I mean, I would like to contest that the most privileged sex worker in Germany is still stigmatized and still has um, a lot of social repression to deal with, and she is much closer to the lowest rank, if you can call it that, most exploited sex worker than she is to the policy makers, the ones who are still speaking on behalf of sex workers who are doing it. Um, I find it extremely important, I could say, to, to shift the, the, the gaze or, or the, this interest, as you say, uh, from the experience of the sex worker to, um, to how uh, these fantasies sort of precede what sex workers or what the sex workers will say. I mean, in any case, the minute that the sex worker speaks, as you, I think, point out as well in the book, um, then it is a subjective experience. It is not objective, and this cannot be the basis of making any sort of, uh, definitely not any sort of uh, a, policy, a policy based on this personal experience, and it, because it is not representative. So the question is, how do you reconcile in this need and pressure to raise like one's voice against these myths uh, and inaccuracies that surround the sex industry, um, with the sort of danger of being like re-subsumed into these sort of voyeuristic logic. And in fact, I could ask you this specifically because an example of this is something that we, we heard when we in, the, in the first section of what, what was raised and that you yourself said that you uh, have to deal the minute that you, that you open your mouth, the minute that the questions come. Yeah, so I've been promoting this book since February. It came out in the US and the UK in March. And so I'll just tell a story that I hope illustrates all of that, because let's have story time for a minute. Um, so I, I went to, to London to promote the book in the, right after the, the very high-profile raids of brothels in Soho. And, and so this was like a big media topic. And also there was a member of European Parliament based there named Mary Honeyball. What a name for someone who is doing what she's doing. And, and so I was asked to, to sit opposite Mary Honeyball... Um, I, it's not insulting. It's just like such like a sweet, tender name for somebody who wants to like meet sex workers with handcuffs. So I, I find like the, the, the it's just a jarring uh, juxtaposition. So I, I am I am set to debate Mary Honeyball. So here I am already violating my own principle, right? I am doing a prostitution debate, and I say I'm not going to debate. And so what I told myself going there was that as I've done for every media appearance, I'm not answering personal questions about my sex work experience. There's an entire chapter in the book that talks about why the book is not a memoir. And the reason for that is, it's a strike, actually. I consider this to be a refusal of my labor. I am not going to perform the labor of telling my story until conditions improve. And that's it. So, and this is not the book for that. You know, so I, and I'm not gonna do it on national television, for sure. So the presenter, uh, actually did not facilitate a conversation between us. She asked me at first, well first her script had said that my name is Melissa Jira Grant, which is accurate, that I was a journalist, which is accurate, um, and that I wrote this book, which is accurate. And then she went off script uh, and said, this is Melissa Jira Grant, she used to be a sex worker, she has this new book and she's gonna tell us all about doing sex work. It's like after two months of negotiating with them, um, giving them the exclusive TV interview, this is what they do. So. 
And mind you, I'm in a pretty lucky position, right? I'm here, I have a book, my publisher is supporting me to be there, my partner is there with me in the green room, and I'm still shaking with rage on live television and trying to figure out how to respond to this and compose myself. And so what I said was, actually, this book isn't a memoir. It's drawn on 10 years of reporting and research and working in solidarity with sex worker activists around the world. It's not drawn just from my story. It's actually drawn from many, many more people's stories, which is a sounder base for policy than one person's experience. And then she asked me four more times on live television to talk about it. And then also, mind you, at this point, she has asked nothing of Mary Honeyball, the MEP. And so I start asking questions of Mary Honeyball. <laughs> Because no, apparently the reporter has decided not to do her job. And, and so I asked her, you know, Mary Honeyball, you know, why are you supporting this policy? You don't seem to be listening to sex workers, da 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 da, da. Um, It was a very upsetting experience, and an experience that has repeated in basically every interview I've done except for two. Um, and it's this, this not wanting to tell the story is such a double bind because I feel like our stories are powerful. And they do matter, they're important. And, and I, I'm not, not sharing it because I'm ashamed or I'm private. Um, I'm sharing it because as soon as I do that, you start becoming qualified by that. And they start deciding how privileged or not privileged you are, how deserving or not deserving you are, how much of a voice you should get or not get. Based solely on what's already in their head, they aren't even listening. I don't know if the labor of telling our personal stories gets us where we want to go. But I know that this is also like a temporary strategy and that we need to also be sharing our stories and keeping our own history in some other way that's maybe not necessarily in the context of you know, what's going on at the Bundestag or in Canadian Parliament now, um, and which I hope never happens in the US. I actually think it would be a mistake in the US for us to have a big national debate in the way that it's happening here. It would be very dangerous. Um, so I, we, in some ways, the sex worker communities that I'm part of are thinking about how do we keep this very small? Um, how do we keep this driven by community and not have this debate taken away from us? because you can't win, right? There is no perfect representative sex worker. The one that's representative is the one in their imagination who conveniently can't speak, right? Because she's not in the room. Or he. And, and they just, they don't, it, it allows them to have all the power when they can say that. So it's hard for me. I mean, the principle that I come back to them with when I get into those situations with journalists or with anyone is that, look, whether I loved my job or hated my job, I still have rights whether I you know, was forced into sex work or whether I was happy every single moment of every single day, it doesn't matter. I still have labor rights. I still have human rights. I still have the right to health care. And I still have the right to have my voice heard in this debate. And they want to believe that the laws that they make somehow don't affect everybody in sex work, no matter how they got there. Like they think they're gonna have one set of interventions for people who are forced, and then those interventions somehow won't impact people who are still working in sex work. You know, in New York State right now, we have what's been rebranded, the trafficking courts. They're just the prostitution courts. They've just changed the name. And so now everybody arrested for prostitution in New York State is considered a trafficking victim. And they will tell you that these courts aren't victimizing people, they're treating them like, or they aren't criminalizing people, they're victims, not criminals, and yet you see women come up in handcuffs and they tell you, no, 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 those are, those are victims of trafficking, those aren't criminals. Um, it's just language tricks, and I think they're, they're the ones doing divide and conquer, right? They think that they can treat us in different ways, but I can tell you for sure in the United States, the police make no difference no distinction in who they arrest based on how they got into sex work. They don't care. I think all this is is a way to control the debate and to keep the control for themselves. I mean, in here, in some ways, again, the element of attempting to push for a lack of distinction between uh, trafficking and sex work uh, works in the same lines, despite the fact that at the moment uh, sex work is legal. And again, I just wanted to 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 pull a few more points to to the issue of uh, of, pr of representation and maybe come back to to the issue of strategies. I mean, first of all, in in here in Germany. Um, what sex workers are fighting for is the right to speak. First of all, to even have our voices be heard, con considering the fact that, that we are continuously being told that we don't represent and therefore we don't have the right uh, to speak again and again. And um, just another uh, point to add to this, um, it's, it is a question of, I mean, 
coming out is always a, a strategical question. I mean, why is um, considering that the that the trafficking debate or the anti-sex work debate so much works on emotion and so much works on the uh, individual case or the bringing out the 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 poor sex workers single stories why can't uh, other stories or emotional or single stories be used uh, for the sex workers rights movement I mean unfortunately uh, this opportunity has been blocked uh, from us in ways that are simply unfair but essentially um, also in either establishing a form of divide and conquer between different kinds of sex workers. And I would like to say something also in this element of you sex worker are not the representative. Is there a representative woman? Of course, is a question that should be asked. Um, do the politicians represent sex workers better than the sex workers themselves? Um, but in attempting to do a divide and conquer uh, between sex workers based on on class or whichever other categories, there is uh, there is also an attempt in or in any any sort of division between uh, anybody who is working for the rights on the behalf of sex workers. Um, there is uh, an attempt to do this um, divide and conquer, which breaks up the movement in Israel and Palestine, which is where I come from. Um, first of all, nobody who is not a sex worker has the right to speak. The minute that you do speak out as a sex worker, you're a privileged one. The minute that you're a male, you're assumed to be um, a client, and therefore you have lost your right uh, to speak because um, you are seen as a, a side in the story, but not the right side. And, and most sex workers will not out themselves, irregardless, again, if they out themselves, they are on the wrong side of the line. Um, but all of these forces should be coming in together, I would hope to stand in solidarity to work together as a movement. So maybe my question is for strategical purposes, if you think that the movement should concentrate on speaking out as sex workers per se, um, rather than like look for an alternative or a less sort of coming out, so to speak, uh, political forms uh, that would address uh, an intersectionality uh, or rather the structural power relations between those who are affected by this discourse? I think there's still tremendous power in an individual story. It just, it matters how it's being used and the connections that it helps people make. So I've actually been talking a lot about one individual person's story as I've gone around with the book. Um, and this happened after I, I finished the book, which is why it's not in there. It would be a huge part of it. And this is with the consent of that individual also. This is somebody who has said, I know my case is going to be a major test case. And so please run with my story. So uh, in, in Arizona, which has some of the most repressive laws, period, in the United States, particularly focusing on, on immigration, um, there has been a really regressive anti-prostitution campaign and a, tip, a rescue project that goes alongside it called Project Rose. And Project Rose exists in collaboration with the Arizona State University Department of Social Work. And the woman that, that I'm speaking of, Monica Jones, is actually a student in the Arizona State University Department of Social Work. The head of that department runs the Rescue Project. Monica Jones is black, Monica Jones is trans, and when she was walking to meet her friends one night in the midst of a Project Rose sting, she was picked up by an undercover police officer who refused to let her leave his car, and he arrested her as a prostitute and brought her to Project Rose, where she was told if she accepted services, she wouldn't go to jail. And, and Monica's a sex worker rights activist, she's a trans rights activist, and she knew her rights, and she demanded to speak to an attorney. And they said, well, we don't have a public defender here, we just have a prosecutor. Monica didn't want to go to jail because she knew as a trans woman she'd be likely to be incarcerated in a man's jail. She had actually been in a man's jail and she knew it would be violent and that she'd be harassed and that she could be abused. So she fought this. Rather than accept the rescue, she fought back. And in the American context, the idea that the person who fights back the hardest, the loudest, and with the biggest impact is a black trans woman says a lot about who gets targeted in the United States by anti-prostitution policing. And it also speaks to a weakness in the sex worker rights movement in the US. Because sex workers who have the most power to come out tend to also be those who are least likely to face arrest, they also have more distance from the most immediate issues 
facing those who are most likely to be arrested, right? So we have this like, kind of division in the movement that is very real. And I don't think that that's unique to the United States. I think you would see different versions of that in different contexts. So I'm so pleased that Monica is taking this risk because it means she's supported by her community in that. And she's still going through her case now. She continues to be harassed by the police in her apartment. No major feminist organization in the U.S. has come out to support Monica. Certainly none of the anti-prostitution organizations who say we shouldn't criminalize the women. Um, it's, it's a very, very brave thing that she's doing. And, and some of the only kind of major groups that are supporting her are sex worker groups who in the U.S. are not major, unfortunately, and the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, the Trans Project in particular and the American Civil Liberties Union who want, to vi who want to challenge the law itself. So her story, like, it comes at this intersection that is very rarely articulated between race and gender and criminalization, the law and who is allowed to speak and the fact that it's the person in charge of her academic department who put this whole thing into motion in order to rescue people from prostitution and that this is someone who was targeted. So I think that's an incredibly compelling and complicated one person story, but I think we need more of that and think about what conditions produce that, what conditions help people who are the most marginalized and the most likely to experience the consequences of anti-prostitution policing and campaigns to come forward and how can we create those conditions? Without those, I think it's asking someone to take way too much of a risk to put themselves out there. Wir können ja im Moment beobachten, wenn man jetzt nicht nur in Anführungszeichen auf die Verschärfungsdiskurse rund um das Prostitutionsgesetz schaut, sondern was überhaupt so los ist in Europa und auch im deutschsprachigen Kontext, dass es, ich würde sagen, eine kulturelle und politische Attacke auf ähm, Social Reproduction Rights gibt, die Rücknahme von Anti-Abortion äh, ähm, Laws und die ganze sozusagen Landschaft gerät in vielen europäischen Staaten und nicht nur hier, auch in Russland und anderen Ländern äh, im Namen eines Backlash, eines kulturellen, der Aufwertung der Familie, der zum Teil religiös unterfütterten ähm, ja, Rückholung alter Bilder davon, wie ähm, zusammenzuleben sei, was das für Geschlechterverhältnisse heißt, für die Rolle von Frauen und so weiter. Und ähm, also wie würde man diese Zusammenhänge herstellen, gegeben, dass da sehr seltsame Akteure auftauchen, also einerseits ein eine rechtsorientierte Partei entsteht in der Bundesrepublik, die sich solche Fragen auch auf die Agenda setzt, aber andererseits auch zum Beispiel religiöse Lobbygruppen, fundamentalistische aus USA, geschafft haben, den Forschungsfonds der Europäischen Union dazu zu bringen, keine Pro-Choice-Forschung in Europa mehr zuzulassen. Ja, und das finde ich verschärft. Also wie müssen wir eigentlich über Du hast das vorhin, glaube ich, schon mal aufgebracht, ähm, über globale Allianzen nachdenken, die sich am Ende gar nicht mehr, das wäre die Erweiterung zu der Frage, was machen nationale Regierungen, das hast du gerade eindrücklich beschrieben, wie kommen wir eigentlich an so eine Ebene ran, gegeben, dass die Machtstrukturen, die dahinter stecken, auch die Finanzierungspower, erstmal auf eine völlig andere Liga ist. Und ich glaube, dass sich da gerade was verschiebt, zu dem wir auch noch mal politisch, und links Stellung nehmen sollten oder gucken sollten, wie wir uns dazu kritisch in der Zukunft der Näheren, wo sich das weiterentwickelt, verhalten können. Welche Allianzen brauchen wir dann auch vielleicht noch? Ihr As könnt the one who lives in Europe, do you want to answer this? I mean, I can weigh in too, but I feel like I'm just stabbing in the dark in a lot of ways. I have to think, but it is a complicated question, first of all. I mean, first, I think that there is a lot of people that are involved in this uh, that are not being brought into the debate. There are, uh, at least in the nearest circles, uh, clients are also affected by sex workers. A lot of queer people that are affected by sex workers, uh, the, the, um, um, sex workers' issues as they are. I'm, I'm hoping that I understood your question properly about which alliances to make, yeah? between different groups. Um, that is other means. Um, and there are feminists who, who don't oppose or, or who do not oppose prostitution per se. And these are all um, alliances that, that uh, should be pursued further, first of all, um, because they are larger than the circles 
that uh, it is that we think that the minute that we open our eyes and look beyond this or that particular sex workers rights, also uh, migration as an, an issue in, in migrant related groups uh, are affected by this, of course. Um, I want to say, and this is perhaps, maybe it's, it's not directly related to, to, to what you've asked, but the issue is also, the issue that is at is, is hand is not just uh, uh, what we fight or, or how we fight this particular issue, but also which policies that we can make to change the situation overall. And these things are not uh, things that are affected directly um, by sex work per se, or by the particular you can say work situation as you previously described about sex work being boring it is not necessarily the site in which um, the, the, the negative things about sex work take place but in a society that is uh, based on patriarchy that is based on violence towards women that is already existing that is based on racism and anti-migration uh, policies. So the people who are working on these issues are people that we should be joining in and to make policies addressing those issues. That once these issues are changed somehow for the better, then uh, a lot of the issues that are facing sex workers would already be affected without directly um, uh, trying to make a policy that affects sex work. I mean, I think that a part of the issue of particularly trying to address the issue of uh, sex work is trying to make regulation for a topic by using uh, this um, exclusive or um, ex exclusionary policies by setting apart sex work from the rest of uh, uh, jobs. If we do see sex work as, as work, which other uh, branch of work has specific legislation that is made only for that? Why can we not see it in uh, a wider labor context as, or as a, as a result of other um, social contexts or social issues that are being addressed? So that the minute that we do address these issues, um, like I said, then a lot of the issues that are pertaining to sex workers would already be addressed. So it is the groups that are working on these issues, whether it's queer groups or whether it's feminist groups or whether it's groups working on uh, uh, migration or anti-racism, those are the groups that we, which, that we should try to make alliances with. I just wanted to add something quick, which may be an example that of some a successful alliance in the US that might also be instructive in Europe, which are alliances between groups that are working around um, abolishing the prison industrial complex and looking at our kind of and our entire carceral apparatus in the United States and our desire to use crime and criminal laws to fix every social ill. And because that impacts so many people, it has created a very big and broad coalition. And I've seen more movement in the US in the last few years around this, particularly not all feminists, but as some feminists are becoming more critical of how the criminal justice system is making it easier for violence against women, for example, to be approached through just passing punitive laws and not actually changing the material conditions of people's lives that allow us to you know, escape an abusive relationship because we have the economic means to do so or that we have the support that we need from our community, that just arresting people is not a solution. So I think the more people who are kind of able to connect that principle to their work creates more potential connections between their work and sex workers' rights when we realize that a lot of this is actually about a state apparatus that's coming from many people in different ways. And then on a work side of it, I'm, I'm particularly inspired by the organizing of domestic workers internationally and, and the ways that they've structured their campaigns. And their campaigns aren't about domestic work is real work or good work. Their campaigns are domestic work is essential work that is happening and we are very isolated and we deserve our rights and we don't have to prove that we love your kids to get our rights and we don't have to prove that we're downtrodden and sad to get our rights. Our rights are our rights. And then they've been incredibly successful at passing domestic worker bills of rights in the United States and also now at the international level. And I'm curious to see, um, because I know there are domestic workers who do sex work and there are sex workers who do domestic work, if that's going to be an issue that starts to be raised. Because unfortunately, in many of these communities that we would like to find allies, sex work itself is, because it's such a stigmatized issue, it's something that they feel like, you know what, we're dealing with enough. 
and we don't want to have to take on this extra thing without understanding that it's already an issue in the communities in which they work and they just might not be hearing about it. So I think sometimes that's a useful way to start to build those alliances as well. If there's an LGBT group saying sex work isn't an issue for us, then they are doing something really wrong. Um, it's, I just can't understand that. And likewise, a feminist group. You know, sex workers are already engaged in all this work because our lives aren't siloed that way, right? So I think it's just about creating space in those communities for sex workers to, to actually express the issues there in a way that's meaningful to those groups. Wir haben ja. viele äh, verschiedene Punkte gehört bis hin zu strategischen Fragen jetzt am Schluss und welche Allianzen oder auch nicht man eingehen sollte. Vielleicht ist das Stoff für Gespräche hier und ich äh, möchte mich bei euch beiden vor allen Dingen bedanken, Melissa, fürs Kommen und dass du uns nochmal Ideen auch ausgebreitet hast. Lia, dir für die Fragen und die Aufbereitung für uns. Katharina, dir für die Initiative und auch das Präsentieren hier des Buchs und euch und uns allen, dass ihr hier seid und wart. Und jetzt ähm, vielen Dank nochmal. Und ja. Let's have some drinks.